Hello listeners, thanks for choosing to listen to us on your choice of podcast platform. Be it Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, iHeartRadio or Spotify. Recently, we are also live on Amazon Podcasts. Just ask Alexa to play Scraps podcast for you and it will it will graciously oblige. Jojo and I however have one request for you. Please do take the time to rate us on these platforms and any feedback you have we will be glad to hear from you. Just about two weeks ago, I received an email that had suffered from so much forwarding that I had to aggressively scroll right to even get near the content. I'm not typically a forwarder of such emails, but I found myself guilty of sharing it yet again. Admittedly, I had to keep the distribution list limited because my eyes were still misty from having read the original email. The story provided some background on a song that I had always loved, but whose genesis I had never considered. Perhaps you've heard of it. The Sounds of Silence by Simon and Garfunkel. Arun and I were in development of our ideal guest list for Scraps, and we immediately agreed that Sanford Greenberg needed to be on that list. Through the help of friends like Jim Wyland, Shelley Freed, Bob Greenberg, not related, and a new friend, Gilin Dagnelli, as well as Sandy's publisher, we were able to connect, and he graciously agreed to share some time with us. Ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to introduce you to a man who served on the National Science Board, the creator of the first database tracking global antibiotic resistance, chairman of the Board of Governors of the Johns Hopkins University's Wilmer Eye Institute, founder and funder of the End Blindness by 2020 Prize, and best friend of Art Garfunkel, Dr. Sandy Greenberg. So, I, I appreciate you coming on. Thank you for your time and, and taking a, a leap with us on Scraps. My pleasure. I think in your, your book that just came out in June, actually June 30th, July 1st of this year, Hello Darkness, My Old Friend, you very humbly reference um, a litany of important and critical people in the 20th century that are your friends. And you mentioned that some of your first forays into commerce um, were your invention of a machine that compresses speech so that it can be consumed more rapidly and readily. Um, in fact, there is a quote from there that I pulled, um, which is, out of my own necessity, I also invented and later patented a compressed speech machine um, that speeds up the reproduction of words without distorting any sound so that you can absorb a large um, quantity of words every minute. Um, this is just one sentence and it's very matter of fact. And then you move on. There's no celebration. It's just a footnote. Can you tell us sort of how this invention came to be? I'd be pleased to thank you for the kind introduction. I lost my eyesight in my junior year at Columbia university. And in order to get through the very long reading list, I had to ask friends to come and read to me. The most uh, significant one was, as you mentioned, Art Garfunkel, who read to me daily, as he had promised to do when I was back home in Buffalo recovering from eye surgery. And I also used a reel-to-reel tape recorder, frustrated by the pace that it spoke at, which was 150 words a minute, which is about the rate I'm speaking at now, I started manually to turning the tapes. And what I got was essentially a distorted, very distorted sound, which made the words unintelligible. And one day I sat back and said, my God, I have to do something about this. I have to figure out a way to compress speech so that I can absorb information as rapidly as my sighted counterparts because 150 words a minute just didn't do it. People were reading at two and three and four and 500 words a minute. 
And so I decided to invent a machine to do that. But of course, I was a senior at Columbia with no resources. Uh, I was blind, as I mentioned. And it appeared to many, including me, that I had no future. But it stayed in me to try and figure out how to do this daunting thing. And I reasoned that basically we human beings have been communicating principally by speaking less and, um, and learning, speaking and listening. <clears throat> and uh, I went further and discovered, of course, that Gutenberg had come along with the printing press 500 years ago. So it seemed to me, perhaps, that we have genetic and historic reasons why we might be capable of adapting as readily to the spoken word as to the printed word. And that was the infrastructure around which I forged ahead. And all of this theorizing happened in my senior year at Columbia. But then I was on to Harvard Graduate School, and I concluded that the fundamental task, based upon what I just said, would be to figure out how to convert the mechanical energy of the voice box and larynx into electrical energy. And fortunately, many of the people who read to me at Harvard were technically technologically oriented, some physicists, some engineers, and there were some other friends I met related to MIT. And for the entire decade of the 60s, I studied and learned. And finally, after all of those years, was able to achieve a patent on the fundamental compression expansion of human speech in 1969. And it has affected millions of blind people and as you know, today, in places like Audible, if you listen, you're able to compress the speech considerably, and many of my friends do that. So it has impact far beyond just the blind. Uh, and that's the brief history of compressed speech. You also mentioned, actually, not even so much in the book, but but in other places. I think you again, it's this humility that I, I, I find impressive and and um, warm. Um, but you were the chair of the Federal Rural Healthcare Corporation, yes. as well as, as some service on the National Science Board. What what were you doing there, and and how did those positions come into play? Well, in 1997, Congress created the Rural Healthcare Corporation, and provided a billion six to fund it, with the goal being to bring telemedicine to the rural parts of our country, which tended to be underserved in terms of medical attention. And so we spent time setting up and began pursuing telemedicine. And as it turns out today, those were pioneering days in which we made significant inroads into bringing that first, of course, to the rural sectors of our country, as the title suggests, but also to then broaden it, which has taken a course on its own. And today at uh, Johns Hopkins, for example, we do a great deal of work via telemedicine. Yeah, it's it, it is once again, speaks to the humility of you as a person, uh, Sandy, because I think what you just described there um, stemmed from your own need, um, but it grew into something that you saw the potential to ultimately help many, many, many others like yourself, um, which I think is is a true mark of an, of an innovator. Um, so thank you so much for sharing that. Um, as Jojo kind of alluded to at the beginning, I think there are a bunch of, of very, very interesting folks uh, who were your roommates uh, at Columbia. Uh, one of them is, is Art Godfunkel, and the other one was Jerry Spire. And 
another person that I think we were all kind of um, very much odd to also know was that uh, Michael Bloomberg was also your, your university and college mate at the time. So as Jojo said, some of the most the who's who's who of the 20th century or the more recent past uh, were your compatriots. So do you want to kind of talk to us about how this whole friendship kind of grew uh, among yourselves at Columbia? Uh, well, I should say something first, uh, not to insult my friend Mike Bloomberg, but uh, he was he graduated about the same time I did in college, except he was at Johns Hopkins I see. University. I see. Sorry about that. Um, but I, I got, I know I got to know him many years later when I became a trustee of the university and he was chairman of the board. And so we built a very close relationship. And of course, he is very known to my friends, Jerry Spire and Art Garfunkel. Um, we roomed together and it was uh, a pretty exciting place to live because at night uh, Art would take out his guitar and I would take out my drums and we'd sing together and I was the DJ and so every night was a joyous occasion after we finished our homework. <laughs> that that's a, That's a tenor of how we were living at the time. So I, I, I think... Um Art Garfunkel is, has played an amazing role throughout your entire, well, starting at, at university, having met at, at Columbia just shortly after school began your freshman year. Um, yes, ma'am. So I'm curious, of all the stories that you recount in the book, meeting him, um, his critical moment when he convinced you to come back to school and try to graduate, not just graduate, but graduate with your class. And then there's another pivotal moment you describe where Art had the confidence in you that you didn't yet have. And he was the, the purveyor of that confidence. He was the reason that you refound that confidence after having lost your sight. And I'd ask you to pull on any one of those strings that you like, but I'm curious which of those three pivotal moments um, that include Art in your life is the most important to you. Very excellent question, very perceptive. They were all obviously important, but the one that has stuck with me my entire life since then was the time when he and I were in Midtown Manhattan together, and he always would take me back to the dorm after we had a meeting, and he decided or was told that he had a drawing due of the Seagram building the following morning because he was an architecture student. I told him, on the other hand, that if I didn't get back to my reader, a friend named Michael Mukasey, that I would be doomed, that my career would be over. Just that simple. Well, we talked in those terms heatedly, for, I don't know, maybe a half an hour, 20 minutes. And he simply decided that he had to go do his homework and left. And there I was in midtown Manhattan during rush hour, desperately needing to get to that local train to get me back to Columbia. And so I inserted myself into the crowd and by staying very close to people and holding on to handrails, I was able to get down to the bottom of the subway station, a very cavernous place, chilling. So I was down there alone and blind, and it was rush hour. And I was petrified. I felt entombed and had a rock solid conviction that I would never get out of that pit. So what else could I do? But I had to get back. So I bumped into columns. I bumped into people, suitcases, coffee cups. And then 
I bumped into a woman's breast. And she was very kind because I had just a few seconds earlier hit a column which cut my forehead. And she took her hand and wiped the blood away and started telling me about the fact that I appeared to be a very nice boy. And at that moment, I was thinking about whether I was a nice boy or whether I had been taken down because of my blindness into real darkness. Fortunately, the encounter went well. She left, wished me good luck, and I, <coughs> excuse me, I turned away from her, rushing away because I was felt fortunate that that incident, which could have been much more uh, dangerous, was finished. I hit a lady who was pushing a stroller, and she had an infant in the stroller, and I tripped over the stroller as the mother screamed at me in a language that was foreign to me. And I wound up with the upper body hanging over the track because I had fallen after tripping the baby. That was a pivotal moment in my life because my initial instinct was to pray that the train would sever me and end the fakery that I was engaged in, trying to prove to everybody that I wasn't blind, that I was just a regular guy, when I knew for certain I wasn't just a regular guy. I had this burden that I had to deal with every second of every day. Then I realized that the people who cared for me, my girlfriend Sue, Art, Jerry, and others, they depended on me in a way to maintain a facade of bravery. And I depended on them for making sure I understood that there was still a real world out there, even though it appeared at many times to be beyond my grasp. So I got up and started walking away. My usual stance was to put my arms in front of me so that many, I'm sure, thought I was a drunkard and made it over to the shuttle, which took me across town to the local, which got me back to Columbia, Broadway and 116th. And I wound up being bloodied, the blood was drenching my socks, my forehead nicked again and again, but I finally sat down and waited, took the long, the long ride up to Columbia. When I emerged from the subway into the sunshine, I might add, which was as glorious a feeling that I think I've ever had, because I knew what had happened, except I bumped into a man who said, oops, excuse me, sir. It was Arthur. He had followed me the entire way and subsequently told me that he never really had a sketch due the following morning. It was his way of trying to make sure that I could do things on my own, that I had confidence in myself. And at that moment, I had gone into the subway with one Weltanschauung, and when I emerged from it, my worldview was completely different because all fear, all doubt vanished. But on the positive side, I now believed that I could do anything I wanted to do.
reasoning, of course, that if you can get through the New York City's subway system as a blind kid, then you could probably take on many other daunting challenges. And so I am indebted to Arthur for that gift that he gave me. My girlfriend, Sue, was extremely upset when she heard about it, telling Arthur that he could have killed me. Of course, Arthur said there was no possibility that he was down there following me and that he could have saved me. And then flash forward to about a month ago when he and I were recording a piece for the Today Show. And we had a long time to chat, and they didn't put this part on the air. But in the middle of the session, it turned out to be a very candid session between Al Roker, Arthur, and me. And he said, Sanford, you know, I've been thinking about it. And I think Sue may have been right. It was an extremely risky thing to do. And I contradicted him. And I said, Arthur, it was the most important thing anyone could have done for me because that episode defined me then and it defines me now. Thanks, Andy, for actually describing that in the most eloquent, but at the same time, touching manner. I think I've actually read that excerpt from the book before, but just hearing you speak and just describe it in, in every detail, as you just did there, just kind of makes me, it it just gives me goosebumps and, and I'm at a loss of words for that. But I think it's just incredible. Um, and I just want to kind of bring and just highlight what art did for you. I think the resolve in art to actually not do anything while you were probably kind of hanging from the train track and with the upper part yeah. hanging out of the train tracks or onto the train yes. tracks just speaks to me as to how much he wanted you to succeed. I mean, it was extremely tough love. I mean, it must be tortuous for him to be able to do that uh, while you were going through that, his best friend and someone he loved as much as what, what he did himself. Um, did, did you guys ever talk about that? And I'm sure you did. Uh, for the most part, we never really, over these decades, never really talked about it. And actually, I had the first frank conversation about this in front of Al Roker, of all things. How, how does this crazy thing happen? It came out because we were just reminiscing and talking casually about anything and everything. He and my girlfriend, now wife, Sue, have had a number of conversations about it, and it was always one way in which she blamed him for putting me into that kind of a situation where I could have easily been murdered. Yeah, yeah. No, it's it's just an incredible story. And hats off to art for actually having that resolve because that is a very very tough thing to do i i agree i agree i i should say one other thing that about arthur since we first met in september of 1958 at freshman orientation week as jojo mentioned before uh, he has always had confidence in me and that whatever I dreamt I wanted to do, he supported me. It was the same way with Sue, but Arthur was not that close to me as my girlfriend and now wife has been. But that confidence, even back in the dorm room, was everything to me because I would often sit for hours in the dorm room alone wondering what would my future be? I think one of the things that you mentioned in the book that actually stemmed from early on in your freshman year is that you and Arthur made a, he actually extracted from you, I believe, a promise. (laughs) 
<laughs> Sorry. Yeah, he did. And, and it, I, I, it's very clearly he's, he's kept up his end of the bargain, but there's a moment there where, where you pay him back. Could you tell us that story? Yes. I'm sure there are many moments, but I think. Yes. No. Yes. I, I think so. After I graduated, I went up to Harvard graduate school for study. And then fortunately received a uh, Marshall scholarship to study at Oxford university. And the first month or so that I was at Oxford, I got a call from Arthur saying, Sanford, I am dropping out of architecture school. And he knew that I would not approve of that because I felt he'd be one of the greatest architects ever. I talked to him for years and saw his drafting and his designing, and it was simply marvelous. So... He, I'm trying to explain this, but very difficult to do. Well, I'm a little choked up, so if you could we, ask me another question or sure. repeat that one, and I can be a little more clear-headed now. Okay. This has been an emotional trip for me. Sorry. Well, no, and I appreciate that. And and if if our candor is going too deep, we 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 no, certainly understand. No, not at all. Okay. You you you're both you're both very insightful, and uh, you honor me by having read the book. Well, thank you. I, I devoured it actually, but I I think it's it's not an understatement to say that were it not for your um, mutual promise with Arthur that Simon and Garfunkel yeah. might not actually have ever happened. So, it, Well, I, I don't know. As, as I was going to say, when, you know, at Oxford I got this call in which he said he was leaving, and I tried to persuade him not to, but that's what he wanted. He told me he wanted to go into business with his friend Paul. Now, I had met Paul during our college years because I would spend many weekends in Forest Hills where Paul went to school and we three would sit around the table talking about a whole sort of a whole sort of different items on teenagers minds so when he said that he wanted to go into business with Paul my, as soon as he told me, I said, what can I do to help? And he said, I need $400. I knew very well that Sue and I had $404 in our checking account. But in that instant, I said, you'll have your money. I will write the check out as soon as we hang up, which I did and sent it to him immediately. And it was the least the least I could do, given how he saved my life, or at least, if not saved my life, he pointed me in a direction that was positive and forward-moving, instead of my sitting home alone, fearful of the future, and of course, as I said, in, with much doubt hanging over my head. I think this is this is amazing because it, one of the things um, from the book is that when you first became blind, sort of the options that were offered to you were justice of the peace and making screwdrivers sort of se seemed to be the two um, leading vocations for the blind community at the time. And also also caning chairs. Caning chairs, yes. King, caning them, and, yes. and your commitment and refusal to accept that as your future and, and sue by your side in endorsing your um, drive. I mean, you've gone on to do so many other amazing things. And I think um, maybe now's a good time to start talking about the End Blindness by 2020 prize. Um, I know it's being awarded on December 14th, COVID permitting. Okay. Um, yes. but, but that's actually a very specific date that you 
you chose for this. Would you mind telling us about how you arrived at December 14th, 2020? Yes. The backstory is too long right now to go into. I'll summarize it by saying that when I was in Detroit Sinai Hospital, having had just having had surgery, my eyes newly dead compelled me to then make a promise to God that I would do everything I could for the rest of my life to make sure that no one else should go blind. That was naive, adolescent, idealistic, and totally impractical at that time. But I clung to that dream decade after decade after decade, which and Sue joined me in that every step along the way. And science had not yet progressed to a point where we thought that it would be at the outer edge of reasonable to talk about ending the scourge. We talked about a campaign to end glaucoma, to end retinitis pigmentosa, to end macular degeneration. None of those, in our judgment, would bring attention to the fundamental problem. And so we decided that given all the technology that the blind have access to, including, among other things, compressed speech, it still was insufficient to give them opportunities to work. For example, the National Federation for the Blind, and this is before COVID, so I don't know, it's probably worse now. They said that 70%, 70% of blind Americans are unemployed. That, that is simply intolerable. That is the great injustice of this scourge. And so, I was inspired by President Kennedy because he made his moon speech uh, two months after I lost my eyesight. And it was, to me, lying there, my life ostensibly over, listening to some guy who said, we are going to the moon, but not only going to the moon, we're going to return that person safely to Earth. And that's not enough. We're going to do it before the end of the decade. I thought that was insanity. But he had said it. And the nation began preparing to take this on. And it turned out that it took from Kennedy's announcement in 61 to July 20th, 69, when Neil Armstrong landed on the moon, that was 2,798 days. And I reasoned, or I should say Sue and I reasoned, that if we could go to the moon in 2,798 days, why couldn't we end blindness in that period of time? And so we began announcing this, the website says, and still said then and says now, an appeal to the brilliant minds of this generation. October 18th, 2012, we announced that publicly. And December 14th happens to be having just completed 2,978 days. That's how that particular date came to be. That's fascinating to hear the correlation between or the inspiration, I must say, to, between the moon landing um, speech that was given by um, Jack John Kennedy and um, the End Blindness by 2020 initiative. Um, what are, can you actually just walk us through as to what are the various aspects that are 
that will potentially be in contention at this point of time? Is it purely just therapeutics or is it also ways in which uh, people people's lives could actually be enriched? So what are the various things that you're considering as part of the initiative? Fortunately, we have a scientific advisory board of 12 of the most distinguished scientists in the world, three of whom garnered the Nobel Prize. And these people were instructed by our governing council, which has 12 of the most distinguished civic leaders, to look around the world, every part of the world, and pick out the people who could be in a place where they would be the awarded the the monies for research. This this is not money that just goes to a person to go buy a yacht. This has all got to be put back into research. And the, the scientific advisory board is now concluding their selection and on December 14th uh, we'll describe who the people are at our ceremony. It uh, frankly was going to be at the Supreme Court under the auspices of Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg but because of COVID we're now making other plans. So any any chance we can get a sneak peek of who's on the short list? <laughs> I would be violating my promise. I would love to. Well, perhaps perhaps sooner than you think. Sorry to break this up guys. Just wanted to remind you to rate us on your podcast application. We thank our sponsors, Cortec. Please visit cortec-neuro.com for enabling tools for your neurophysiology research. One of one of the things that I noted is that you and you had second thoughts about this, but I think you took the right direction, which is um, with the with the challenge, you went for the the whole megilla of curing all blindness instead of taking it piecemeal. Yes. Um, was that by design and and how do you feel about that goal now? Yes. I feel personally that it was the only appropriate goal to have. As I said, I could have done end each particular disease that affects the eye, but it seemed to me that that, that wouldn't do it. And it's important to use the word end because it's very clear. We're not here to ameliorate blindness. We're not here to be preventative. We're simply here to end it six million years. We human beings and our bipedal ancestors have suffered this affliction. And science is now on the verge, on the verge of making this not only a possibility, but a probability. So the prize goes out um, December 14th, payable in gold, by the way. Yes. Which is an interesting, no? No, 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 that, no, that was, that was true a number of years ago. And uh, frankly, we decided that the transference back into currency uh, first into gold and back into currency would be um, wasting a few hundred thousand dollars that could be going for research. So we changed that. And, and maybe a little bit heavy to carry rather than a, a yes. big cardboard check. Yeah, <laughs> that's correct. So what's next for you after the prize? What happens for the Greenbergs on December 15th? That's quite an excellent question. Well, the movement toward ending blindness will not end for us until it really completely happens. Uh, I believe within this century, 
we will have ended this six million year scourge that is in many ways destroying the souls of people who are blind. You cannot imagine, you cannot imagine what it's like to operate in a world, in a world where the Lord created it for sighted people, but then not to have sight. Obviously, it's the, the most fund fundamental thing about it is that it's survival. And you can be sure over the centuries, over the millennia, many blind people were lost to others who didn't think they were worthy. And the, let me tell you, particularly Arun, about a year or so ago, I had lunch with the head of the National Eye Institute. He had just come back from India, and he told me that uh, when he asked me the question, what is the average lifespan of a person born blind in India? It's much less. I would probably expect that it's probably in the mid-40s to early 50s. Two to three years, because what happens is that those who are blind and can't work are left in the corner to wither away. This is what this man told me. If I had heard it from anyone else, I would not have believed it. So that's shocking. It 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 it, it shocked me tremendously, and that's why I made my promise that for the rest of my life I will do everything I can to make sure no one else goes blind. But you see, beyond that, there is one component of blindness that to me is central, and that was the disease I was afflicted by, glaucoma, which destroys the optic nerve, which as you know is part of the brain. And I have theorized that if it is part of the brain, which is, of course, the core of the central nervous system, then if we can regenerate optic nerve tissue, what's to prevent us from regenerating nerve tissue for quadriplegics and paraplegics, perhaps even Alzheimer's? And that's a dream I haven't shared publicly, uh, and but I'm committed to see that happen because the central nervous system is the core of our humanity. And civilization deserves to live perhaps not longer, but while they're living to have some degree of serenity in their lives, some degree of fulfillment in their lives. And so, and so, the way I said it is that when we succeed in ending blindness, and as you know, I believe we will, then all of God's children can not only feel the sunshine on their faces, but can witness with their own two eyes its rising and its setting. Then, and only then, I believe, will creation be made whole. Yeah, that's very, very profound, and it touches the heart in so many different ways. Um, thanks for sharing that, Sandy. At this point, we want to break and bring to you listeners a very perceptive comment from Sandy. Just before we started rolling, Sandy was asking me about where I was from and his fascination and love for India as a country and its culture. Take a listen 
when we join Midway, as Sandy explains about a pen pal he had from India. And a young man in India wrote to me and he said, I have seen what you've done and you're a young scholar and I would like to offer you one of my two eyes because I can do just well, just fine with one. And how do you respond to something like that? Yeah. This, uh, how, that, that, that your culture could be the reason why he asked that question, why he generously wanted to give me one of his eyes. Yeah, I think that story, interestingly, Sandy, is also rooted in a bit of Hindu mythology as well, where I think you might have probably heard of the god uh, or the male god Shiva, who, yes, of course, um, many arms, many arms. Yes, correct. And I think, um, and one of the devotees, and Shiva is probably the one that you can get a god or a personification of God in Hindu mythology, which gets as close as possible to someone who lives in, in a cremation ground, kind of has ashes on his body, has a snake around his neck and, and has as a moon and also has as river Ganges kind of flowing out from the top of his head. That's the depiction that you hear about it in in mythology. And he was so profoundly taken aback by one of the incarnations or forms of Shiva that there was a hunter. And the only thing that he would actually do was to hunt a deer every day and offer it to uh, to actually a statue of Shiva or a Linga, as it was called. Um, and he would just provide it uh, as an offering every single day. And one of the days he couldn't find a deer. Um, and the story goes that he actually offered one of his eyes to to Shiva because he just thought that there was no better way to actually take care of of his of his deity than actually offering a part of himself. So, yeah, I'm I'm not I'm not surprised because people are extremely warm and they kind of they have a lot of empathy. Uh, and I think that is that is one big thing that I learned from from where I grew up was the amount of empathy that people have towards other people. Uh, it's just incredible as a society. Wow, that's very, very helpful, putting into perspective something that has haunted me for decades. He and I began a correspondence that lasted for many, many decades, and every couple of months he would send me some tea from India, and uh, I got hooked on it and uh, have loved it ever since. So I, I appreciate that uh, that background. I wonder if you think 2020 reflects those same kind of values that you talked about. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think one follow-up question that I have, just just moving a bit tangential to the End Blindness Initiative, is, is about the feeling of empathy. I think a feeling of empathy is a very common string through your life that others have shown you, that you have been able to kind of execute uh, once you have once you've been able to be in a position to kind of show that to others, etc. But when you were talking about the end blindness initiative, I think there was both empathy and I kind of sensed an innate excitement, an excitement of an innovator, a person who actually wants, who gets excited by science and who gets excited by the next new thing um, in, in terms of helping people. Um, so on the theme of excitement, uh, can you just share with us what gives you or what gave you and what continues to give you the most amount of excitement in, in your life? Uh, because I think that that can take many different shapes and forms. So we would love to hear that from you, Sandy. What excites me about progress of science in this area? And I'll give you both. Science as well as, as 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 well as in as well as beyond science as well. So it, based on what you feel, what excites you the most um, in science and outside? Personally, to do everything that I can to diminish human suffering in all forms. I find it difficult, and particularly in these times of COVID 
to see the profound suffering of so many of our fellow human beings. And so what is exciting to me is to try, as I said, to diminish the suffering of so many. And I don't know if in the future, if we do end blindness on time, which I think we will, there will be so many other things that need to be done to move the path of the progress of civilization. We are all little pebbles on this path. And if each, each of us does what they can do to move it forward. Sadly, there are people who are there to try and block the progress of civilization. And so those of us who are trying have to redouble our efforts to do it and take it on seriously. On the science side, there's a group of scientists at the University of Pennsylvania who discovered a gene called RPE65. There is a disease called Labor's congenital amaurosis, which is distantly related to retinitis pigmentosa. And Labor's congenital amaurosis largely occurs in young children who have inherited the disease. And two years ago or so, the FDA approved for the first time the use of gene therapy to be used in the human body. What these people have done is the following. They would take these blind young children. Those who were blind were blind because of a defective gene called RPE65. These scientists manufactured in their laboratories a healthy gene, RPE65. They injected it into these young people's eyes and within a few days, they could see again. That's ending blindness. That's nothing short of spectacular. I, I really believe that. I could not agree with you more. It is stunning. And as important is the fact that this gene therapy is now beginning to be used for other diseases in the entire body. It's outstanding. You know, I, I think that there's um, a particular balance that you have it, from what I've been able to read of yours. And I, I think it's the good and the bad, the ups and the downs, the, the belief in the promise and the dedication to work toward that promise. So if I could, I just want to, I just want to read to you one quote from the book. Actually, it's really for the benefit of the listeners. Um, and it is this, you know that my luck has come on an oscillating curve, bad, good, bad, good, on the verge of beginning the life I wanted, losing my eyesight and then becoming, as in my exuberant exaggeration, the luckiest man in the world. Yet this joy that I feel now is unadulterated by pain and suffering. I have no sense of a calculation of the bad measured against the good. I consider that I have chosen life and embraced it that I have a golden place in life with family and friends. And I wanted to, to thank you for this particular passage because in, in so many discussions with friends and family about are you an optimist or a pessimist, I think you have succinctly distilled why I personally am an optimist. And it, it, it speaks again to your balance of there are good things and bad things, we go fast, we go slow, we make progress, we have setbacks. And it, I found it to be incredibly inspirational, and I wanted to share that. So thank you. Thank you very much for saying that. That's, uh, those words were hard gotten. <laughs> but I'm glad, I'm, I'm glad I was able to come to this place in life where I believe that with every molecule in my body. Did you want me to comment further? Oh, I actually, um, 
I think there's there's one other note that I wanted to ask you about, and and to if you could recount the story of your tikkun olam. Well, tikkun olam is a phrase in Hebrew that means repairing the world or perfecting the world, and that people who share my faith, it is believed that they ought to be doing that throughout their lives. And it's similar to what I was talking about before, about the pebbles on the path of progress of civilization. We we all have choices in there. Justice Ginsburg writes in her foreword that I chose life in all its vibrancy. And that's that's so accurate. Choosing life is pretty much everything. Many people don't choose life and as a result are often left in the backwater of human despair. Yeah, that's, that, is, that is a great segue in terms of, of moving to another passion of yours, uh, Sandy, which is your, your interest in art, not your friend, uh, but, but actually the, the art uh, in the museums. And <laughs> one, of the, one of the most amazing, yeah. and for me, I think in a, it speaks to how perceptive you are, is your innate ability to kind of perceive art. And that started really when you were young. So do you just want to tell us about how your love for art uh, started and how your friends have been so instrumental um, to let you perceive art and, and still see the world um, in, in the colors um, that, that you still kind of have uh, as, as they narrate? Very, very excellent question. Uh, I started, we lived in a uh, poor section of Buffalo. I grew up there. And my father died at age five, leaving my mother with $54. I think you know this from the book. And my mother had to take care of three children under the age of five with that $54, as well as take care of her mother who always lived with her. And would you, would you mind repeating what you just said? Cause I'm off onto a different tangent. Sorry, Sandy. Um, my question there was about how you develop an interest in art. Oh, in art, yes. How 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 did that? I, uh, how did I, your friends kind of enable you to still pursue that interest? Um, for, first, I began drawing as a young boy. I, I was able. To, we had nothing in the house. Uh, it was a wooden house that was pretty barren. But I was able to, from school, obtain a piece of paper and a pencil. And I started drawing portraits, mainly, of people to try and capture their joy or their sadness. And, in fact, the last drawing I did, as I was losing my eyesight, I drew a portrait of my brother, Joel, which is still hanging in our living room. And as a reminder to how important art has been to me my entire life, even as a young boy, I would basically almost inhabit the Knox Albright Art Gallery in Buffalo. But when I got to Columbia, that was a whole different story. Not only was I initiated into the secret treasures of knowledge from across the continents and the millennia. I had the art of New York City to study. I took a humanities class 
fine arts humanities. And I had a teacher whose passion was simply infectious. And he would tell me that I should go out, for example, and purchase a Frank Stella drawing because, and this is 1959, because he said he will be one of the greatest um, artists of the 20th century. So I went out and <laughs> it cost $500, which was a ransom. That was half my tuition. Uh, so it was not possible. But he inspired me to study intensely everything that was around me, and particularly art. So I would go to the Frick Museum, where I saw Rembrandt's self-portrait and stood in amazement in front of it. A week or two after the, Mont, the Guggenheim Museum opened in New York, I was in there examining inch by inch every Montreal. I went over to see the Vermeers in the Met. It was simply breathtaking. And I have a reservoir. I have my own library in my head of books and art, literature and art. And when I got to Columbia, I found people who loved art as much as I did. And then, of course, because of my junior year and my loss of sight, I had to ask these same people to go with me to the museums and translate as best they could what was on the canvas and translate it so that I could understand it. And I would stand there often. Well, actually, before I lost my eyesight, I recall one day on Wednesday afternoon going over to the Museum of Modern Art to MoMA and standing in front of Guernica, Picasso's massive work. And I couldn't get over it. A good three hours spent looking at it. I was so enamored by it that a couple decades later I took my wife and my children to see Guernica in Spain where it had been placed originally. Uh, when they described art it was uh, it, all the images were printed indelibly on my mind and they still do. I am extremely fortunate. I have a very good friend named Frank Stella. And if you look at the frontispiece in my book, he took my compressed speech machine, the original prototype, and he turned it into a sculpture, the picture of which is in the book. And he is now in the process, because he believes in our end blindness campaign, is creating a signpost so that for years to come, that will signal what we are working on as humanity, the end of blindness. That signpost will become very important in the years to come. And this came out of a man's heart and talent. And so, uh, when I first met Frank, he took me by my hand in his studio and walked me around to every single massive piece of sculpture he had done and described every piece of it. Probably one of the most thrilling days of my life, certainly as it pertains to art. Art is at the forefront of societies move forward. Why do you think the Russians created the gulags? So they tried to erase the progress 
of the arts because they knew that from the progress of the arts comes a different society and they didn't want that to happen and what this country has done brilliantly is support the arts in all forms when i first came to washington in 66 there were no such entities as the national endowment for the arts or national endowment for the humanities there was no kennedy center but the city has now become replete with wonderful museums and extraordinary art and so wherever i've traveled around the world i would always make a point of asking sue or one of the uh, people who's in charge of tours to try and set some time aside to describe the pictures to me that is that is so amazing to hear those stories uh, sandy i think in terms of just segueing away from art and your descriptions there i think you've had even by any standards a very illustrious education educational kind of career or a path from your time in columbia over to oxford on a marshall scholarship over back to harvard on for your phd in political science and i think one of the few kind of pieces of information that we know of is that you went to um you went on to become a fellow in the lyndon johnson administration at the time um yes. so which actually speaks to the fact that you've had a fantastic path and you took up a role as a fellow in in lyndon johnson administration can you actually shed a bit more light uh for for us and for our listeners as to the various positions and jobs that you had since you finished your education and just as a second part of that question what in your opinion was the best job that you ever had <laughs> living <laughs> that's brilliant there is nothing else that i can say to that <laughs> <laughs> no i yes, think I, i think that's that's the truth there is there is such profound joy in our lives that uh to ignore it is almost sinful again from my personal perspective white house fellow opened the world of politics to me in a way that i never could have dreamed in 1961 i was in the detroit hospital bed newly blinded and in 1966 sue and i were invited to a reception at the white house by president johnson to meet his entire cabinet astonishingly good fortune and the the white house uh was a very magical place at least in those days president johnson was was very supportive of me and my career there was a moment when he created something called the technology gap between western europe and the united states and bill hewlett and donald horning the president science advisor and one other person and i were the task force to go and meet with the prime minister's foreign ministers and ministers of technology of our six western U- european allies prime minister fan fanfani of italy was urging the president to focus on this problem when i was there there was a meeting in berlin and the a man stood up to speak his name was stoltenberg i believe he was minister of technology for germany at that time and he said something that changed my life in a very unusual way not from a point of view of the cosmos but in a specific way in regard to my business 
he said, we here in Germany can train unskilled people to operate and maintain the most sophisticated technological weaponry in the world. And I was aghast. Take unskilled people and train them to operate M1 tanks? That was extraordinary. When I went back to Washington, I sat down with my friend Bill Moyers, who has remained a friend my entire lifetime. When I first met him, I was 25, he was 32, and we became intimate friends over the years. And I told him about what I had heard, and then I immediately went to speak to Secretary Willard Wirtz, who was the Secretary of Labor at the time, and obviously, therefore, interested in manpower training. And what I explained to him was so exciting to him and to another friend I'd worked with, uh, Secretary Orville Freeman, and Dr. Jim Goddard, the head of the FDA. And when we all left government, I created a company that manufactures general purpose system simulators, specialized computers, so that now not only could unskilled people be trained to operate the most sophisticated technological weaponry, but they could also use it in the commercial sector, for example, to learn how to regulate and deal with fossil fuel generators. That's where I stand. So I have one last sort of big picture question for you, which is as, as well, actually, no, I'm going to take one quick segue so that you can settle a longstanding family debate for me. Um, you briefly mentioned in your book um, your friendship with a gentleman with a last name, Z-A-G-A-T, who went on to found the guide. Now, the question in my yes. family is, is it Zagat or Zagat? Or another. Zagat. Zagat. Okay. Zagat. Thank yeah. you. So as... He just sent me a book. <laughs> yes. I have Go. a shelf full Go on. of guides from around the world. He's a wonderful, wonderful man. He literally yesterday just sent me a book he wanted to, me to read about democracy. He's just an extraordinary, extraordinary friend. So of all of these friends... Zagat, Spire, Garfunkel, Tom Watson, not the golfer, by the way, Bill Hewitt, David Rockefeller, presidents. You have the benefit of so much uh, and so many great resources and tutelage. What would be your message to the next generation on what they need to be focused on and where they need to place their drive? <laughs> that. That's a great question. I wish I were able to answer it fully. I'll do the best I can. I think it's important to realize that even the bad things in life are to be appreciated because even the bad things are a source of remembrance flavor of this life. As you know, life is very precious, our lives, how we live them. You can't find it any place else. And when it's gone, it's gone. For example, I will tell you this story. Beethoven, at age 28, wrote a letter to his brothers in which he said, I was standing next to a man and the person several yards away from us was playing the flute and I could not hear it. One more incident like that and I would have ended my life. And here's the most important sentence. I have much art in me to give to the world. And so I endured this wretched existence, truly wretched. This is a man 
who saw shortly thereafter wrote a piece that was titled Ode to Joy. Ode to Joy. A man who believed he was living a wretched existence. Now, the, the reason I'm saying this and why I think anyone who listens uh, ought to think about it anyway. Life is both the bad and the good. And Beethoven, to me, stands out as a man who understood that sometimes or most of the time you have to live a wretched life, but that does not prevent you from bringing music into the world. Each one of us has music. There was music on this podcast amongst the three of us. And to despair over that and just focus on the bad things is giving yourself and your life short shrift. Ode to Joy. Choose Life. Thanks, Sandy. I think that was very powerful. Um, I think Jojo and I want to thank you for such a wonderful conversation. Uh, in some places, it literally bought, uh, brought tears to our eyes. And it's not because of what you were saying. We've probably heard that and read that, but it was just listening to you say it in, in your own voice. I think that was magical, uh, in my opinion. And I hope that all of our listeners will be able to appreciate the many facets of you that you shared with us today. I think the most important ones that st- that will stay with me and, and Jojo is the fact that when you were almost invoking the Bible and without actually saying the words that I am my brother's keeper, I am my sister's keeper, and dealing with every single aspect of what you were doing uh, with a lot of empathy and compassion and your drive to succeed um, and to change and impact people's life who are an end world suffering um, in the ways that you can is truly inspirational. I think for me, more than anything else, on a personal front, um, it is the accountability that you have actually exemplified in the book, both to yourself and more importantly, as you said, to the people around you and beyond that to the society around us. It was truly inspirational. And I think there is just one thing I want to say in conclusion. Uh, When I asked you the question, what gave you the most excitement in life? I think you just summed it all up in one word, which was, and you just said living. I can't, I can't think of a better answer that was ever given to any question that I asked in my life. And that to me, you actually made me listen very intently. And I, I want to thank you for that. Uh, it's, it's, it's been an absolute privilege, honor, and a pleasure to have you on the show with us, Sandy. Thank you for those comments there. <clears throat> Deeply moving to me because both of you have asked me questions and nobody else has asked. Uh, when I wrote Hello Darkness, My Old Friend, as you may know, I wrote that to myself, that I started at Harvard Graduate School with the uh, discussing my two previous years after I went blind, and I typed 40 pages. And then I put it away, for, put them away for 40 years, which gave me decades of introspection. And I concluded that each of us who's given the gift of life are obligated to account for it, and preferably in writing, because that forces precision. 
And after I concluded that, I was then ready to sit down and write Hello, Darkness, My Old Friend. And your comments, both of you, have been so insightful, and I have learned so much from your questions. From your questions. So uh, for me, it was similarly a great privilege to have been invited by both of you and to actually have had this conversation. Well, thank you. It, it's an honor, and we will be joining you in spirit on December 14th as you continue your quest, and we wish you and Sue and your um, incredible family all of the best. Thank you for, for joining us. Thank you, Jojo. Thank you, Aru. Our main sponsor is Cortec. You can find their information at cortec-neuro.com. We hope that the listeners enjoy reading Sandy's book, Hello Darkness, My Old Friend, How Daring Dreams and Unyielding Friendship Turn One Man's Blindness into an Extraordinary Vision for Life. You can find this on Amazon and, and many other internet outlets and at your local bookstores. Our soundtrack was provided by Acid Dad. Our sound editor was Sainthan Chandran. And this is Arun and Jojo signing off. Thanks for taking a listen. Yeah.